Good evening, and thank you for joining us. It is Monday, February 13th, 2017. The time is approximately 7.42. We're broadcasting live from Poker Flat Research Range, 30 miles north of Fairbanks, Alaska. This is day one of the February sounding rocket launch window, and doctors Christina Lynch and Robert Pfaff are sharing this launch window and expect to be launching two rockets for their respective missions. Tonight's launch window is from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Alaska Standard Time or 11 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And with, with me here is Roger Smith, the Emeritus Director of the Geophysical Institute and Professor Emeritus of the University of Alaska Fairbanks Department of Physics. Welcome, Roger. Well, it's good to be here. This is a good situation. We're awaiting to do some important science with rockets tonight. Very excited to hear a little bit more about both Doctors Pfaff and mm -hmm. Lynch and their rocket launches. Um, maybe we could just uh, give a quick status report of where things are in the in the stream of time this evening for the mm -hmm. rocket launches. Yeah, maybe we can. So here we're here we're at T minus ten. That means we are at a stage of preparation which will take us about 10 minutes to get to a launch when they decide to start um, and pick up the count. So right now we have the rockets elevated uh, at the range and they are ready to be fired if, uh, if the uh, sequence goes through successfully. But right now we're waiting for good weather. Right now it's cloudy and uh, we can't do all the measurements that are needed from the ground for the rocket flight to be successful. Well, wonderful. We'll hope to see a little bit more activity coming along shortly. Um, you'll notice that you're hearing some uh, commentary or talking and over uh, the launch OC broadcasting okay system. Turn on, turn it over and to, to um, those are the personnel who are supporting the launches as they go through their checks preparing for the launch mm -hmm. to happen um, so we're gonna go ahead and let that happen and in the meantime why don't we just talk a little bit about poker flat research range and um, this facility that we're at right now well back in 1969 this range was built by um, one of the faculty at the geophysical institute neil davis and a bunch of technicians and graduate students. Not the normal type of construction team that mm -hmm. you'll find, but this was a brand new and important opportunity for us to construct a rocket range that the Army needed at the time. And that's how we did it. So over that time of uh, uh, much more than uh, nearly 60 years, in fact, um, we have built a range which is quite extensive. And we have a map showing uh, that range uh, up there. And you can see uh, what a bird's eye view would be of the range. And it has various items uh, on that range. I think there's, a, there's actually words to show which of these are. We're currently at the, uh, what's called the SOC, or the Science Operations Center, which is in the bottom right corner. And then the launch part of it is in the, uh, near the, the top left corner where there are, in fact, five launches, only four of which are marked. Uh, but, and we might, you know, we, I think we'll be using two of those launches tonight if the uh, program is successful. But, um, so also, alternately, you, know, you can, can look around and see other buildings on the range. We have a place for rocket storage. We have a place for rocket assembly. Um, and we have an administrative building. Uh, and we have a tele telemetry section. Now these are, the scale of this map is such that there's about a mile and a half from one corner to the other diametrically across the uh, screen. So it's quite a large facility. And uh, right now the voices that you're hearing over the, the uh, range communication system are people who are sitting down uh, on the lower range in the blockhouse. And um, 
possibly also people in the telemetry building? Yes. Um, so the person in charge of this range um, um, is uh, actually in the blockhouse, and her function is to determine all the steps that are going to occur in launching the rocket um, and to determine whether we are ready to do the next step. Um, she is a point of reference for that. Um, she will, for example, at some point or other, direct some people to drive trucks out to the road so that we can mount a roadblock because it's not permitted for traffic to drive by when we're going to launch the rocket. So we will hold up the traffic at some point during the countdown uh, whilst we wait for the rockets to go. So that person is uh, ultimately in control. Okay, if we could uh, take down the map showing the range and again go back to the launchers. So there you have the, the rockets that are raised up and waiting for, right. for a launch. So, so this, uh, <laughs> this window opened at a time where it was just dark enough to do measurements from the ground that are needed for support of this uh, investigation. And it's going to, uh, the window will end when the moon comes up, which makes the sky too bright for both the rocket experiment and for the ground experiment. That's going to be just one and a half hours tonight. Uh, tomorrow night, it will be about double that. And I understand uh, from what we heard over the radio not too long ago that they may be launching some test rockets. That's right. Test rockets are used to test uh, the, ra the radar. Um, radar is used on this range in order to measure the, uh, the flight trajectory of the rocket. And um, so we want to make sure that it's actually correct. So we use test rockets to do that. And we may see one or two of those test, ro test rockets go. There will be a countdown to a firing of the test rocket, but not a long one. <laughs> okay. And we're Peter, just listening. 15 volt system and the uh, PMT 13. Just listening to what they're what they're working on. Um, we'll go ahead and hold with this view um, in case they want to launch those test rockets fairly mm -hmm. soon. Back to see a, a, a rocket going slowly PMT up. Heater. Test rockets are so fast that the by the time you hear the noise, it's already disappeared. <laughs> Arrow, this is 301 TM. Go ahead. Yeah, you should have a photometer heater and a PMT 13 volt power on the 301 vehicle. We see it. That one's a lot warmer than the other one. Showing skin temperatures around uh, 70 degree F. That's consistent with what we're seeing. MM, this is 301, TM. Go ahead, TM. Uh, yes, uh, they're finished uh, peaking up uh, with the antennas there. That's all set. We're just waiting for uh, 
them to finish looking at the uh, PMTs. Roger that. MM, this is SLC. Go ahead, TM. Yeah, we've basically seen everything we need to see. Everything looks good. Um, the uh, 301 payload is still much warmer than the than the 306. 306 looks like it's about, um, I would guess, uh, around zero degrees right now. Roger, SSC. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and shut back down again then. Okay, Roger. 306 mm, I mean 306 TM mm. Go ahead. You can go ahead and shut back down. Copy. 306 PLC, this is 306 TM. Go ahead. Please bring down the heater and PMT. Copy. Three hundred one TM mm. Copy. We're going to do the same. Three hundred one PLC. This is TM. Go ahead. Uh, can you, uh, you're kind of, kind of weak, uh, 301 PLC. Uh, can you speak up a little bit more? Go ahead. Very good. Uh, if you could turn off the 13-volt uh, PMT power and the heater power for 301. 306 heater and PMTs are off. Copy. 301 13-volt bus and PMT heaters are off. Copy at 301 PLC. Can you go ahead and turn off the uh, sub payload uh, transmitter and bus? And oh. turn off transmitter two on the main payload and transmitter one on the bus. 301 LOS. CM is down. LOS all links 301. 306 PLC is 306 TM. Go ahead. Go ahead and bring down the sub transmitter and bus. Copy. Sub, sub transmitter and bus are off. 306 sub LOS, go ahead and bring down the main transmitter and bus, please. Main transmitter and bus are off. 306 main LOS. Well, it looks like it'll be a little while until the test rockets are launched. So um, earlier I had mentioned that there are two missions that are sharing this launch mm -hmm. window. And um, uh, one of those is the, the mission uh, known as Neutral Jets in Auroral Arcs. That's under Dr. Robert Fath, who is a space scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And um, we have uh, some information about his mission that we'll go ahead and, and air right now. I really envy everyone on the 
who lives in Alaska, particularly in, Bar in the north, because you, the aurora is there so frequently, and it's really part of your, as you said, part of your culture and part of, part of your lives. Down in the lower 48, you know, we don't get to see the aurora that often. In fact, I grew up in Los Angeles, where we didn't see, don't see the aurora at all. But I want to just say, from a personal standpoint, when I first saw the aurora, I was 22 years old. I was in Norway, and um, I was working at an observatory that studied the sun. But we were getting ready for dinner, and somebody said, there's a great aurora going on right now. And I went, aurora? And I ran outside. I was, I was peeling a potato at the time. And I took the potato with me. I didn't have a coat. I stood outside, and I was just fascinated by the aurora. It was, it was, it was mesmerizing. I loved it. And really, I think that sort of started me on my whole career. Here, over 40 years later, I've, and I'm now still working with the Aurora. I've been with NASA for over 30 years. But that seminal event of seeing the Aurora while I was peeling that potato really uh, made a big impact on my life and how I really wondered what's going on and what's causing the Aurora. So what I wanted to do right now is just show just a few slides about how we use, uh, in the space age, how we use measurements in space to learn more about the aurora. So as we know, the aurora is, is fascinating structures and movement. I think everyone, particularly the audience, uh, knows this. But we're, on, we're asking ourselves why. You know, why does it move around? And uh, so the next slide is an example of you know, just some of, the, some of the shapes and the motions. And we're asking ourselves, what's controlling these forms? Now, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that there's these uh, sort of curtains, that's what we call them, the curtains that generally line up in one direction. So the Earth's magnetic field is really sort of what c organizes the aurora, what controls the aurora. And uh, you can actually see that these curtains actually line up with, uh, in one direction, that direction is actually the local uh, magnetic field of the Earth. So that's very important. Now the, the next slide I think shows things that you already know about how the magnetic field is, the Earth has a dipole, how the magnetic field is more or less vertical or highly inclined at the North Pole and the South Pole, and of course that's where it connects to the magnetosphere and to the uh, forces much higher up that actually power the aurora. Uh, the next slide is uh, sort of a cartoon of this, it's maybe not so good, but you can see how the electrons that get shot down or, or accelerated down to, to the upper atmosphere, when they collide with the upper atmosphere, that's what creates the aurora. And then I think if you click on this, I have some words about this. I think actually this was sort of covered in the, the video. But I just want to emphasize that this is a great example of how the, the upper atmosphere of the Earth interacts with sort of the outer space, you know, the, field, the energetic particles and charged particles and electric fields that actually power the aurora. And uh, it's this interaction with the upper atmosphere that gives us, gives us the aurora. And it's really the energy much higher up that's changing the electric fields that uh, control the, the movement and the, the many of the, um, the processes. And that's what we're trying to understand more about, this interaction and also how does the aurora get sort of controlled by, by fields much higher up. OK, next slide. OK, now we want to ask, what we've been talking, so far we've been just concentrating on what the aurora looks like from the ground. What does the aurora look like from space? And here's a picture, I think, I think this one is from the shuttle, actually. But if this, the astronauts actually get great views of the aurora sort of from the side, either at, uh, from the shuttle and, of course, now with the space station. And you can actually see what the aurora looks like. You can see how it, the, um, uh, the aurora light itself, you can sort of get the altitude region. It's from about 50 to 150 kilometers, uh, sorry, 150, 50 to about 100 miles up. And you can see the different colors come from different altitudes, as we saw in the video. And uh, again, it's, that's where the, the energetic electrons that come down interact uh, with the upper atmosphere. Uh, next slide. Now we're going to actually take another view from space, but in this case from way high up. Many Earth radii high up from the Dynamics Explorer satellite. There's been other satellites also that have been taking images of the aurora from high above. And in this case, you can see that there's an auroral oval pattern. And, uh, and this sort of brings a, a, a region of the, um, of the formed by the uh, magnetosphere and how that interacts again with the uh, sending down the energy and the particles that interact with the, uh, 
with the upper atmosphere. The, the most important thing to say is how the, the oral oval is, it goes, of course, over, you know, continents, goes over the oceans, and you can actually see as the Earth then goes, uh, spins below it, how the aurora changes during the nighttime. So the next slide actually shows a sequence of, a, of aurora photographs by an imager, again, the DE-1 satellite, and these are about 10 minutes apart. And you can see how the aurora changes. This, is, this particular event was something we call a substorm. That's a very large uh, solar activity from the sun and a very large magnetic storm. And if you look at the upper panels, you can sort of see a little dot. Uh, let's see, that would be over on the top right-hand side. There's a little dot. So you can see how the aurora actually is very focused there with a, with a um, uh, with the energy coming in right around midnight, that's the strongest aurora, and then how the sub, that's what we call the beginning of the substorm, and then how the aurora itself then uh, evolves and gets stronger, and the whole or and the whole auroral oval is actually uh, becomes quite active. And then the scientists like to then look into more detail and see how the poleward edge, and I think that would be closest to where uh, often where the you are in, in Barrow. Uh, can have a different type of aurora, stronger aurora than sometimes the equatorward edge, and we study that and we look at how it's going westward flows and that sort of thing. So this, the whole evolution of the aurora on a, on a given night is a, of great interest to scientists because it tells us how, how the, the larger scale processes that are going on. Okay, now the next slide. So then the next thing I want to talk about is how we use sounding rockets to study the aurora. And sounding rockets have been really part of the space age ever since really the late 1940s and 50s and when NASA got started in 1958 it, it was very, had a very active rocket program that it still has today and in fact one of our most important rocket ranges is at Poker Flat, Alaska which is uh, owned or operated by the University of Alaska at Fairbanks uh, and that NASA, that's where NASA actually uh, uh, comes with its payload. So here's a picture of the front gate and then the next slide just show some other scenes from Poker Flat. Uh, this just shows you what the uh, range might look like. And that slide, you know, we use big antennas to get the data back from the rockets. We don't, these rockets send payloads into space and we, they send the data back by radio signals, radio telemetry, and we pick them up with this big uh, an, uh, antenna and then we analyze the data later. So the next slide shows uh, so we're getting the payloads ready to go to the rocket. Uh, on the right are two payloads that we're going to be launching in this campaign. On the left is just an example of one, uh, one experiment that actually, that's our electric field experiment, that goes inside the skin and then act, act after the payload goes into space, the nose cone comes off and then arms come out and the, that's with the sensors that take the, take the measurements. Okay, the next slide is just how we, this is a rocket that's ready to launch. You might wonder, what's this uh, styrofoam thing? We actually put that around the rocket just to keep it warm. And in fact, the rocket is, is poised, ready, ready for launch right now. If it can also come down, the, whole, the launcher can, can come down horizontal and goes inside this uh, uh, covering that you see on the left. That's sort of pulled back and then the rocket goes, at, is what we say, it's elevated and ready for launch. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then our specific experiment is, is going to be looking at how does the uh, auroral energy interact with the upper atmosphere. Now we know we have auroral light, and we've been talking a lot about that, but there's other things that go on that you can't see with your eye, and one of them is that we believe that the upper atmosphere has movements and motions which can be enhanced by the aurora, and we call these jets, and this is just a, uh, a model by some theorists showing that the uh, you you should have uh, an increased movement of the upper atmosphere when you have the aurora. Of course, this is very high up, it's about uh, you know, 50 to 100 miles, but it's still it's very important motions that we're trying to understand, and there's heating involved with this and other, other processes as well. The next slide uh, shows our experiment. It's actually, in this case, it's not just one rocket. We're going to have two rockets that are going to be launched simultaneously, one going about 100 miles up, the other going to 200 miles up, they have similar instrumentation, looking at electric fields and, and energetic particle, particles, and this neutral motion, this neutral wind that I was talking about. The next slide uh, shows actually a sketch of the payload, and you can see we have these probes that measure electric fields and magnetic fields, and there's energetic particles, and of course 
the neutral motion, so there's another dedicated instrument for that. Okay, next slide. And now, actually, what we do, how you might decide, when do you decide to launch? We decide, of course, we want to have clear skies. We want to have the aurora, of course. But the aurora has to be in just the right spot. It has to be, it can't be over Fairbanks. It has to be north, where we're going to be launching the rocket. And uh, we also want it to be a stable arc. And what, we, what the University of Alaska has is a whole system of ground-based experiments that they, uh, they operate actually throughout the year. And then there's a displays. And we, we look at these displays, and we use those to determine when to launch. And this was actually from a launch a, a few years ago. OK, next slide. And then as we, this is just a still, if you show you videos of this, the uh, rocket goes off, it's very dramatic, it goes off in really a split second. You can actually see little particles from the styrofoam box there as the rocket's going through it. And then it goes up into space. And the final slide uh, brings us back to the very first one that I had, showing how the rocket you know, goes up into the, through the aurora and over the aurora. And uh, it's very exciting for us as scientists and all of the measurements that we take, we, we share with the public, of course, and we, we, uh, this is a scientific research which we think everyone benefits from. And, and I just want to end by saying there's still much to be learned with respect to the aurora. And I think the sounding rocket program, and particularly the Poker Flat Research Range right here in Alaska, is very, very helpful for helping us solve these problems. So thank you. And that was Dr. Robert Pfaff again from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center talking about his neutral jets in Aurora ARCS mission. Um, now, Roger, what new information is likely to come from this experiment that will contribute to the existing body of knowledge on Aurora? Well, prior to this rocket experiment, it has been difficult, if not impossible, to know what happens as a function of height with the, the wind which is uh, existing around Aurora Arcs. So the reason for having two rockets is to make a measurement uh, in a vertical plane so you can uh, see what happens as a function of height. And then uh, you've got some of that uh, vapor distri distributed across a horizontal distance. So we really have a three-dimensional representation of the wind as a function of height. And this is something that cannot be done with a satellite, and it cannot be done from the ground. You need a rocket to fly through the medium and distribute the vapor so that we can do this. So it's, it's original. It's, it's a new idea we're going to get. Brand new data to try and understand this phenomenon of jets of, of air near auroral arcs. Great. And I understand there will be two rockets launched then just um, almost simultaneously That's right. flying to different heights. They, they actually, the one that goes to the higher height, of course, is going to take longer to get up there. So I, I think he's going to launch the front, that one first. In the meantime, launch the other one, and they'll reach their apogees at about the same time. OK. So, so that will make the best use of the opportunity. OK. And uh, we do have a graphic that was provided by NASA that shows the, mm -hmm. the vertical space above Earth and where the, the vapor would uh, occur in the atmosphere. Yeah, and you can see that white wiggly line in the middle. Uh, it says tracers follow the high altitude winds. So if you look at that with three separate cameras um, that might be about 50 miles or so apart, uh, then you can get by stereoscopic um, construction exactly where each part of that trail exists. And it's actually quite high up there in the atmosphere. I see the, the airplane flying down That's right. quite, a, quite a ways below there. So those rockets actually travel pretty high. They do. Um, yeah, well, this, these rockets are going up. The, the higher one is going up to about 200 miles, and the lower one about 100 miles. OK. Well, it looks like we are uh, looking at the down at the lower range again, and um, I, I can't tell from that picture. Can you see, Roger, whether it's likely that they are, are still waiting to launch those test rockets? It, it does look like, yeah, although, you know, I'm looking at that flashing red light down there. It looks to me like that's a truck with its lights going, maybe waiting to, to go out and uh, block traffic. Okay. Well. 
I know that there are certain conditions necessary before they can um, go ahead and launch these rockets. They're mm -hmm. going to be looking at several different factors That's before right. they make that decision. Can you um, explain what, what types of conditions they might be looking for? Well, to start with, they'd like to know that there really is a jet in place around the Aurora. And uh, Dr. Mark Condy has some instruments deployed one of them is at Tulik Lake, another one is at Eagle, and another third one is right here at Poker Flat. And they can look into the sky and get a, a pattern of the wind at the height at which these measurements are going to be made to see whether there is a jet there. And this isn't anywhere near as high resolution as the vapor measurements will be, but it will tell us there is something to be seen. So I imagine that is going to be one of the conditions. Um, so you must have clear skies at those three locations I just mentioned for the instrument to work. And then there are the cameras that are going to be taking the photos of the trail that you saw, the squiggly line. They also need to have clear skies. So that's quite a wide area if you think about that. You know, as far north mm -hmm. as Tulik Lake and as far east as Eagle and Poker Flat, we're talking about hundreds of miles of clear sky. So that's, con that's a condition that's necessary. Um, and then if the rocket is fine, then they will fly so long as the local conditions for launch are good. And sometimes the wind is blowing too hard. And because these rockets are not guided, they have to, they have to fly uh, ballistically according to which direction you launch them. And so with a strong wind, it, there's too much uncertainty about where the rocket's going to go, and so mm -hmm. for safety reasons we can't launch. But tonight it's pretty calm. It's right. calm, but also cloudy. But also so cloudy. So, so, so we have we have one of the conditions that's okay. And I dare say the rockets are actually ready to go too. But mm -hmm. and then uh, we have kind of a short uh, launch window this evening, mm -hmm. and I understand that has something to do with the moon. As well, well, it does. Um, we can start when when the sky is dark enough for these ground instruments to work. And that's, um, that was the determined the start time of 7 o'clock. And we are stopping when the moon is about to come up over the horizon, which is the 8.30 time. Okay. So these are the ideal times. And um, so because this is just the beginning of the window, we're looking for the ideal conditions. Uh, okay. And so unfortunately, of course, we don't have a chance because of the cloud. but. Um, even then, you see that there has to be an aurora to be seen, and um, maybe the aurora just isn't very strong, and that might be another reason why we won't launch. Okay. And then regardless of the conditions, I understand the entire team will still come out every evening, uh, weather permitting, and That's go right. through this process. Yes. Um, you can't miss an opportunity. So I think there, there is people, they have their station time, which is about noon, I think, for this rocket. And um, they have to be here and they must be ready to launch in case the weather's good. That's the way it goes. You've got this limited opportunity. Uh, there is so much money spent on this rocket uh, being successful. You can't miss the last few details. Everything has to be right. Okay. And um, I think I mentioned it earlier, but just once again, the Tonight is the first night in the, the launch window, and as I understand it, it goes through March 6th at this point. Um, and then uh, we're hoping that at some point during that um, span of time, mm -hmm. things, things will be just perfect for this launch. And That's right. And they'll be able to conduct the experiment as planned. That's good. That's what of course, we do have two experiments here that are simultaneous on the range and only one of them can be launched at a time. So we have this concept of one experiment being prime and the other one being secondary. So the prime has the option to launch whenever it wants to and the secondary can use any other time that's available. Um, and so they oscillate between being prime and secondary during the launch period that's common to them. Okay. Right now the Dr. Faf has the prime. Okay. And um, let's see, we do also have a little bit of information we can share about Professor Lynch's mission. 
Um, Dr. Christina Lynch is an experimental physicist and professor of physics and astronomy at Dartmouth College, and she serves as the principal investigator for the ionospheric structuring in situ and ground-based low altitude studies mission, and that has been dubbed ICE and GLASS, which is the acronym for that long title. Mm. Um, so what uh, information do we have about Dr. Lynch's mission then? Well, Dr. Lynch is interested in how the electric fields that come from the highest region of space around the Earth um, influence the ions in the ionosphere and then the neutrals in the, that are in the atmosphere to create the phenomenon that we see. Um, and this has been a, um, a, a puzzle for us to work out over many, many years. And it, it takes more and more complex rocket experiments to get the details right. And so she is she's working on that here. This is an exciting experiment. And so she's making measurements of, uh, of, I, of beams of particles coming in and currents that are occurring in the ionosphere, as well as um, measurements that are associated with the movement of uh, the aurora and the movements of the um, atmosphere around it. Okay, and I understand that Dr. Lynch does have a blog on the Ice and Glass mission, and that is uh, can be found at http colon slash slash Ice and Glass mission, which is i s i n g l a s s m i s s i o n dot blogspot dot com. So if anyone is interested in following uh, her mission, feel free to go to that blog spot and see what's happening each day. Now, Poker Flat is kind of a, a unique range in its, its location is, of course, ideal for studying the aurora, but also because the, they have the ability to have ground stations that can be looking at these launches from different points in Alaska, correct? That's correct. It, uh, in fact, the, if you were to project the range area of the, the Poker Flat range, the, the space available to launch rockets onto a map, it will be about the size of the state of Connecticut. And so it's a huge range in that sense and bigger than any other range available uh, in the United States that has land area in it. Um, now, of course, if you launch over the ocean, you may have a large amount of ocean, but then it's not so convenient to put your stations out mm -hmm. in boats rather than on land. So, so we do have that opportunity here at Poker Flat. Um, we can, we're about 600 miles from the coast here, so we have that full distance to be able to use for ground observations. Okay. Now we have a a video that we can show as well that talks about sounding rockets for those of you who um, may be curious as to what a sounding rocket is and why we use sounding rockets for these types of, of studies and um, we'll get that up and be able to show that to you. A sounding rocket, sometimes called a research rocket, is an instrument carrying rocket designed to take measurements and perform scientific experiments during its suborbital flight. Sounding rockets take their name from the nautical term to sound, which means to take measurements. The rockets are used to carry instruments from 50 to 1500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Since 1959, NASA-sponsored space and Earth science research has used sounding rockets to test instruments used on satellites and spacecraft and to provide information about the sun, stars, galaxies, and Earth's atmosphere and radiation. Sounding rockets fly in parabolic trajectories, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere downrange from the launch site. During this relatively short flight, scientific data is gathered and transmitted to a receiving station on the ground for analysis by researchers. The scientific requirements vary for each launch and cover a wide range of purposes. For example, satellite calibration, solar measurements, and student experiments are a few of the many purposes sounding rockets are used for. For this illustration, there are six phases from the launch to the recovery. Phase one is the launch. 
Phase two involves D-spin and payload separation. D-spin is where a weight and cable system known as a yo-yo is deployed to D-spin the payloads. Phase three is boom or door deployment for science gathering. Phase four is at apogee, the highest point of flight. In phase five, the doors are closed or the boom is retracted or ejected. And then in phase six, the payload comes back to earth and the payload and data are recovered. Oftentimes the payload is reconditioned and reused. Well, Roger, it looks like it's about 8.27, and the launch window does close at 8.30. Mm -hmm. um, it does not appear that uh, they were able to launch the test rockets this evening, right. um, and it looks like there will not be a launch tonight. That's, that's so. So we've gone through the first of the days uh, that are possible to launch this rocket without any action. But that is not unusual, and as, as things go with uh, rocket launching, there are many things that have to be right, as we said before, and so it's not possible to do the experiment tonight. But then tomorrow night's another chance, and so on. So we are confident that it's going to happen. And so, uh, for those of you interested in following through um, and and seeing the eventual launch of one of these missions. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at PokerFlatRR, or you can check the Geophysical Institute's Facebook page or the Poker Flat Research Range Facebook page for um, information about when we will next be broadcasting. Uh, once again, we want to mention that Poker Flat is operated by the Geophysical Institute under contract to NASA Wallops Flight Facility, which is part of the Goddard Space Flight Center. And this broadcast was funded through the NASA Heliophysics Education Consortium under a cooperative agreement with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, there are some social media sites that may be of interest to our audience. More information on the NASA sounding rocket missions is available at www.nasa.gov forward slash sounding rockets. And um, range launch communications can be monitored at http colon slash slash stereo dot wavestreamer dot com. Um, also Dr. Lynch's ice and glass blog at http colon slash slash isinglassmission.blogspot.com and uh, also we would like to acknowledge um, Ron and Marquita Murray the Aurora Chasers for sharing some video that they have of a rocket launch in 2015 and uh, so please visit their website at www.theaurorachasers.com. And that will conclude our bro broadcast for this evening, night one of the February launch window at Poker Flat Research Range. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Roger, for Thank you. helping with the broadcast. <laughs>